In the first century, a Jew was born in this city who was destined to blaze across the Roman world proclaiming the everlasting gospel. From Jerusalem to Rome and possibly even to the gates of Hercules, this fatigueless traveler proclaimed that Jesus Christ was Lord. He traveled more miles in the first century than most Americans traveled in the 20th century. And yet, he was not an explorer or a geographer or a politician. He was an apostle. He was one sent forth to proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ was Lord. The New Testament registers over 13,000 miles that he traveled visiting many of the cities, towns, and villages of the Roman Empire. In this fascinating series, In the Footsteps of Paul, we will trace his journey through the Roman world. We will seek to understand the cultural context and the historical setting of the world in which he traveled, and then to understand the message he communicated. We begin in Tarsus, where he was born and spent his early childhood. Then we will travel to Jerusalem, where he was schooled at the feet of one of the greatest rabbis of the age. From the holy city, we will follow his footsteps up the Jordan Valley and over the Golan Heights to Damascus, where he was converted. From the world's oldest continually inhabited city, we will travel to Antioch, queen of the east and third largest city of the Roman world. This is where the followers of Jesus were first called Christians. And it was from this church that Paul was sent out as a missionary. From Antioch, we will trace his footsteps through the Roman province of Asia, visiting some of the greatest cities of the day. From the shores of the Aegean, he saw a vision of a man from Macedonia calling him to come over. We will follow his journey to the port of Neapolis, where he first brought the gospel to Europe and then walked the Roman road out to Philippi where he founded a church. He was strangely rewarded for delivering a demon-possessed girl here by being beaten and thrown into prison. Ultimately, Paul's ministry in Europe led him to Athens, the philosophical center of the world. Here he proclaimed Jesus before some of the greatest minds in the world on Mars Hill or the Arios Pagas. One philosopher accepted the gospel and became a believer. Paul would return to Jerusalem where he would be arrested and sent for trial before Caesar. Our series will conclude in Rome where he will be tried and ultimately beheaded. This will be an enriching and unforgettable experience as we trace the journeys of Paul on the screen and in your syllabus. And by applying the lessons of faith from Paul's life in the first century to ours in the 21st century, our faith will grow and deepen. In this first chapter in the series, we will begin here in Tarsus, the place where Paul was born, seeking to understand his roots and what qualified him to become the apostle to the Gentiles. By God's providence, his family heritage, his education, and his culture all converged together to equip him with a special understanding of the Roman world and grant him special privileges to travel throughout the empire. When we first encounter Paul in the book of Acts, he's not called Paul at all. He's referred to by his Hebrew name, Saul. Now, if you were to name your son after one of Israel's kings, you would probably name him David, not Saul. Why would they name their child Saul instead of one of the more illustrious kings like David? Because Saul was not from the tribe of Judah like Jesus or David. Instead, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Let me read to you a fascinating insight about his background found in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. 
Not only was Saul an Israelite, he was a Jew, born of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day according to the custom of Moses. He was a son of a Pharisee. Now the Pharisees were the Hasidim, that is the pious ones. Their modern counterparts can be seen today worshiping at the Western Wall in Jerusalem or walking the streets of New York and Los Angeles. Their numbers never exceeded 6,000 in New Testament times. They meticulously attempted to obey all of the details of God's law, living out the Torah in every detail of their lives. Saul noted the looming threat that Christianity brought to Judaism and he attempted to counter that threat by public debate and ultimately by persecuting the believers. Yes, Saul was Jewish through and through. His pedigree was impeccable. His knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures extensive. His love for the traditions of the fathers complete. This was the man who was destined to become the mighty apostle Paul. But his Jewish background alone could not prepare him to become the apostle to the Gentiles. You see, a Pharisee's perspective was far too narrow. It was too centered in Palestine. And so God chose Saul. Not Saul the Pharisee from Jerusalem, but Saul of Tarsus. We read in Acts chapter 21, verse 39, I am a Jew from Tarsus and Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Yes, Saul was born here in Tarsus, which was the capital of the Roman province of Cilicia. And we might wonder, what was an observant Jewish family doing here, some 500 miles from Jerusalem? According to tradition, Saul's family migrated from Upper Galilee to this area sometime before the birth of Jesus. We do know that Saul's father received his citizenship from Rome so that this man was born free as a Roman citizen. This granted him special privileges. Yes, Saul says, I was a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Tarsus claimed to fame was its unique geographical setting. It was located on the Sindus River where it empties into the Mediterranean. Tarsus was the Roman capital of the province of Cilicia. Tarsus guarded the Cilician gates to the north. This was the major trade route connecting the east with the Anatolian Plateau on the other side of the Taurus Mountains. This was extremely strategic and because of this, the Romans made this the capital of the province of Cilicia. The Sindus River descends from the Taurus Mountains far to the north. The snow-fed river is extremely cold, and that's what the word Sindus means, the cold river. I'm walking along the ancient Roman road. The Romans constructed this bridge over the Sindus or Tarsus River. This road connected Tarsus down on the coast with the Anatolian Plateau in the highlands. The Taurus mountain range is a snow-covered range most of the year, extremely high and very difficult to cross. There was only one major gap in the Taurus mountains and it was carved by this river the Sindus, also known as the Tarsus River. This river carved through a gap known as the Cilician Gates. The Roman road paralleled that river. They built bridges over it. Alexander the Great marched his armies down through the Cilician Gates to the Fertile Plateau. And when he reached the hot, humid plateau here where I'm standing, he went swimming. The frigid waters caused a chill for Alexander, which nearly cost him his life. Think of how the course of history would have changed if Alexander would have died here. This river is rich in its history, for it was on this river that Cleopatra, 
sailed up after crossing the Mediterranean on her barge to meet Mark Anthony, who was residing at his imperial palace here in Tarsus. In the Taurus Mountains to the north, a very special variety of goat was bred with a unique fleece. From their hair or cilium, a cloth was woven for making tents. The fibers in this cloth had unusual properties allowing sunshine to stream through, smoke from the cook stove to be emitted while repelling rain. This was the Gore-Tex fabric of the day. The tents of Tarsus were known far and wide for their exceptional quality and durability. Saul learned this important trade from his father and would use it to pay his expenses in the different cities from Jerusalem to Rome. Because of the city's support for Caesar, it was declared a free trade city, which meant that it had the right to import and export goods without paying Roman taxes. This contributed to its exceptional growth as a commercial center. The city also possessed a university and was the greatest philosophical center outside of Athens and Alexandria. It was governed by scholars proud of their Stoic heritage. But Paul was not educated in the prodigious schools of the Gentiles. Instead, he was educated in the synagogue where he learned to speak both Hebrew and Aramaic. In addition, he spoke Greek, the common language of the day, and as a Roman citizen was fluent in Latin, the official language of the empire. Doubtless, Paul heard the Stoics debating in the marketplace, but as the son of a strict Jew, he would not have been permitted to associate with them. Saul grew up living in three cultures. His religious culture was by the strictest standard Jewish. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. The cultural and business context of the city he grew up in was Greek, and Saul was thoroughly familiar with it. He could easily move in the world of business and commerce. He might even have traded in goat hair the raw material for manufacturing tents versus actually sewing them. And being a Roman citizen granted him tremendous privileges. He had the right to travel throughout the empire without being questioned. And as a citizen, he could never be crucified. Tarsus was an outstanding location for business, education, and culture. But his father was concerned about the heathen influences on the boy and sent him to Jerusalem to finish his education. This would have been the first of many voyages he would undertake during his lifetime. Saul would have left the port of Tarsus and sailed here to Caesarea. This was the finest port on the Eastern Mediterranean and built by Herod the Great himself. He named it after his patron, Augustus Caesar. The Greek word for this was Sebastos, which meant magnificent, the same as the name Augustus in Latin. Yes, this was a magnificent port built in honor of Augustus Caesar. We don't know if this was Saul's first time to this port or not, but we do know it would not be his last. He would sail in and out of it on numerous occasions as he would later become Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles. But from here, he had not come to see the splendid city that Herod had built and named after his patron, Augustus Caesar. He had come because this was the port serving Jerusalem. The pilgrimage to Jerusalem was the ultimate for Jews both in Saul's day and in ours. The psalmist summed it up well in Psalm 137 when he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if I forget you, may my right hand lose its ability. May my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. When Saul came to the city, the Temple Mount dominated the site behind me. Today, the Dome of the Rock stands there, the third holiest site in the Muslim world. This is a place where, according to Muslim tradition, Muhammad ascended to heaven in a night journey. But when Saul came to the city, Herod's temple dominated this site. This was the most beautiful building ever constructed upon the earth. Herod had greatly enlarged the plaza upon which Solomon's temple stood. It was large enough for 12 soccer fields with the bleachers to be inside the plaza. It was a magnificent structure, fabulous buildings, white marble, 
Everything inside of the building was cedar and covered with gold. Yes, it was the ultimate journey for a Jew in both Saul's day and ours to come to the city of Jerusalem. We're standing here on the Mount of Olives overlooking the Temple Mount. This is the religious center for the three monotheistic religions today, for Judaism because it was the site of the holy temple of Yahweh, the only temple Yahweh ever had upon the earth. It is precious for Christians because it was here in this city that Jesus often taught and where he was rejected and ultimately crucified and rose from the dead. And it is holy for Muslims because this is a site where according to their tradition, Muhammad ascended to heaven in that night journey. When Saul came into the city, it was filled with over 480 synagogues or schools. Saul was confronted with many different sects. There were different types of Jews here. There were the Sadducees, the aristocratic, wealthy Jews who controlled the keys to both power in the city and in the temple. Then there were the Herodians. The Herodians were the ones who had adopted Greek culture and tried to mingle Greek culture with the ancient Jewish religion. Herod the Great would have been part of the Herodian group. They were looking to build various Greek structures in the holy city and participate in Greek life. And then there were the Essenes. The Essenes removed themselves from the city of Jerusalem. They would live out in the desert very simply in a communal life. And then there were the scrupulous Pharisees who attempted to honor the Lord by faithfully obeying every detail of the law. The word bar mitzvah comes from this time. It means literally son of the law. According to Acts chapter 22 and verse 3, Saul chose to attend the school of Gamaliel, grandson of the greatest rabbi of the era. They believed in the scriptures and held to the hope of the resurrection of the dead. They were Pharisees, which comes from a Hebrew word meaning separated ones. They were the successors of the Hasidim or pious ones. They were very, very orthodox and deeply concerned about preserving the religious purity of their people. They vigorously rejected Hellenistic practices and longed for the coming of the Messiah. At the time of prayer, Saul would have worn the liturgical vestments. He would have worn the talat or the prayer shawl and would have put on the tefillin, the leather straps worn on the forehead and the right hand that contained a copy of the law. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 14 he wrote, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. While his career soared, he recognized that there was something missing in his life. Soon, news of the Galilean prophet began to filter in. While Gamaliel, his teacher, had not taken a direct stand against the teachings of Jesus, Saul could see that this new way threatened the very foundations of Judaism. And so Saul took it upon himself to debate against these believers in Jesus to show the ridiculous nature of their claims that some guy could die and come back to life. Certain influential leaders saw great promise in Saul, not only as a rabbi defending the Phariseistic traditions of the fathers, but as a fearless zealot who could place a check on Christianity. He was commissioned by the chief priests who were largely Sadducees to root out the followers of the Nazarene. He soon became a specialist in refuting the followers of Jesus. He was certain that all of these teachings that Jesus was the Messiah and had been raised from the dead were only a pack of lies. And yet as he interrogated believers in Jesus, his heart was troubled. In the back of his mind there was a small question. Could it be that it was true? To stifle his conscience, to put out the questions in his mind, he threw himself wholeheartedly in to persecution of believers. 
He describes it in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Saul became an expert in trying to deprogram the unfortunate ones who had fallen for this new cult. Not only did he try to rescue the perishing, he began to persecute the leaders of the church as well. But in spite of his best efforts, the ranks of Christianity continued to explode here in the city of Jerusalem. Acts chapter 6 and verse 7 says that even a great number of priests began to believe in Jesus as their Messiah. And some of the believers seemed to have the same miracle working powers that Jesus was purported to have had. One such man was named Stephen. He was performing great wonders among the people. Stephen was one of the original seven deacons who had been ordained by the church to minister primarily to the Greek-speaking Jews of the diaspora, those Jews who had gathered here from all over the Greek-speaking world. Soon a great disturbance broke out. There was a public debate and no one could refute Stephen's arguments. He was brought before the Sanhedrin where he would have come face to face with Saul. But even Saul's brilliant mind could not match the simple testimony of Stephen, given from his heart, a heart that had been touched by the resurrected Jesus. Soon, the Sanhedrin rushed toward him in an insane moment and drug him out the Lion's Gate, also known as St. Stephen's Gate, into the Kidron Valley. And here in the Kidron Valley, they picked up stones and they threw them, crushing the very life out of Stephen. Stephen was the first Christian martyr, the first one to die for Jesus. Luke notes, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. When you cannot refute someone's testimony, you do the next best thing. You try to silence their voice. And that's what happened here in Jerusalem. When they could not refute the teachings of Stephen, they silenced his voice forever, they thought. And yet, Stephen's testimony was even louder because now the church was scattered throughout all of Judea and into Samaria. Luke continues on in chapter 8, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Saul was consumed with purifying the religion from the Galilean heresy. After cleaning up Jerusalem, plans were laid for Saul to travel to Damascus, where he would purify the synagogues of the dreaded heresy there. Saul would leave the city of Jerusalem with letters from the chief priests, giving him authority to arrest the believers in Damascus and bring them back to Jerusalem to stand trial. He was given a contingent of the temple police, but since he was a Pharisee or a separated one, he would not walk with the temple police, but would walk by himself. It would be a 150 mile journey down to Jericho, up the Jordan Valley, and around the Sea of Galilee, and then over the Golan Heights. This would be at least a seven day journey, an ample time for the Holy Spirit to work upon his mind. As Saul walked along, trudging mile after mile up the Jordan Valley, he tried to get one image out of his mind. The image was that of Stephen's face lit up like an angel as he was brought into the Kidron Valley. A Stephen saying that I see heaven opened and I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father's throne. You know, it's very interesting that other places in the New Testament say that when Jesus ascended into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. But when Stephen, the very first Christian to die for his beliefs in the Lord, is being stoned in the Kidron Valley, Stephen looks up and says, I see him standing at the right hand of the Father's throne. It's as if Stephen sees his Lord jumping up and Jesus is saying, Stephen, hang in there. Be faithful even unto the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. You see, Jesus had been crucified in the city of Jerusalem but he'd come back to life on the third day. He had been seen, perhaps Stephen was one of the 
120 that had seen Jesus alive in the city of Jerusalem. And now he sees him in heaven. And because of that, Stephen is able to witness for his Lord even when they are taking his life. As Stephen falls to the ground, the stones crushing the life out of him, he says, Father, forgive them. Jesus, don't hold this against them. Forgive them. Saul cannot get those words out of his mind. As he walks up the Jordan Valley, he struggles with those words. How could someone forgive the very people who are taking his life? Saul couldn't shake that. He will not be able to forget it. And as he comes to the crest of the hill, going into Damascus, his life will be forever changed. But that will be the subject of the next chapter in this thrilling series on the footsteps of Paul. As we walk the Damascus road with Saul and we see his dramatic conversion that happens when he reaches that emerald green city. Now, from here on the Mount of Olives, I invite you to join me as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the testimony of someone named Stephen, who was faithful to you even to the point of death, and yet he held no resentment, no anger toward those who were killing him, but was able to ask that his executors be forgiven. And we thank you that that prayer is about to be answered, as we will see on the Damascus Road. Thank you for your power even to reach a persecutor like Saul and to turn his heart towards you. Help us, like Stephen, to be faithful to you wherever you lead, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. From here on the Mount of Olives, we wish you God's blessing and encourage you to join us for the next chapter in this thrilling series on the footsteps of Paul as we trace his journey from Jerusalem to Jericho and up the Jordan Valley around the Sea of Galilee and to the city of Damascus where his life is changed and history is altered. Join us for that thrilling teaching.